Welcome to Christian Living 101 Bible Studies. Our mission is to prepare every believer for the trials of daily life. Can you face Jesus, the King of Kings, upon his return? Do you know the pathway to everlasting life? Listen to God's Word presented without church or organizational bias as you study with Pastor Applegate. Now we join Christian Living 101 in progress. Now today we're going to concentrate on the ministry of Peter as he's giving some instruction to the saints that have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Redeemer. And we're going to be talking about um, how that, that there are those times when every believer faces some kind of a fiery trial, something that is bigger than they are, something that they don't know how to handle on their own, something that they need to have the counsel and the love of God extended unto them, and they need to come to that place where they recognize that indeed, just as Jesus Christ paid a terrible debt for us that we might have everlasting life and uh, an eternal uh, presence in his kingdom to come, we just uh, have to take the time now to maybe set some things straight that have not been altogether made clear uh, as the Bible teachers down before us have gone. There are those who have taught that, um, well, you know, when you accept Jesus Christ, everything's going to be rosy, it's going to be wonderful, going to be total peace, tranquility, all of your needs are going to be met, not going to have any tests or trials, whatever. And oh my, uh, a lot of people want to buy into that. And I think that uh, you and I would like to do that too. But the reality of it is that Jesus said as he uh, was departing uh, this world to be with the Heavenly Father, uh, that we were going to go through things and that he was leaving the Holy Spirit here with us that we might be able to endure and to learn and to have the benefits of, of the kingdom of God here on earth as we live here in the flesh, fighting against the powers of darkness and the forces that come against anything that's pure, holy, and righteous. Let's pray, shall we, before we get into the study? Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. We ask you, Lord, to give us clarity of thought and mind, that you would help us to know and to understand the scripture and be able to receive it in a way that would build us up, strengthen us in our faith, and cause us to be capable of enduring the test of the fiery trials that each of us will face sooner or later. And so we ask it in Jesus' name, Father. Amen. Well, praise God. Go with me now, if you will, to 1 Peter chapter 4, uh, verse 1. I'm going to talk about each verse individually, and there's some things in there that I think that we need to consider as we face life here in this old ungodly world and try to live as uh, we should live according to the word of the Lord and the victory that he has bought for us through the price he paid for us at the whipping post and on the cross of Calvary. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 1 declares, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. Well, we know that Christ suffered, don't we? I think any of us that have been born again into the kingdom of God have come to the knowledge that Jesus paid a terrible price to redeem us, to save us from our sin, to cleanse us from the unrighteousness that we were born with, and to cause us to be able to walk in a place of victory and overcoming power as we serve the Lord day by day here in a very ungodly world. As Christ suffered for us in the flesh, we need to arm ourselves. Why? Because Jesus said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. And so we need to be prepared for that, do we not? And as a result, we need to come to the point where we need to arm ourselves and be expectant to be challenged by the enemy 
just as Jesus was challenged and tormented constantly as he ministered the word of the Heavenly Father to us here on this earth before dying and being resurrected again, that we too might be resurrected with him in due time. We need to be prepared. Those who say, well, you know, you come to Jesus, everything's just going to be nice and wonderful. The truth of the matter is, when you come to Jesus, you have switched the sides of the army that you're serving. And the army that we serve from the time we're born is the army of Satan, the powers of hell, the darkness and, and ungodliness and impurities uh, that uh, beset human flesh in such an awful and terrible way. And we need to recognize that when we accept Jesus Christ who paid the terrible price that he did, that we might be set free from that bondage, that we need to face the reality that we will face similar things situations that, that we will be tested and tried but we do know that the Lord left with us uh, the Holy Spirit uh, to guide direct protect and minister to us as we have need so we need to consider the fact that when I departed the powers of darkness and sin and accepted the righteousness of Jesus Christ that I'm serving a new army, a new power, an authority whose purpose in giving unto us eternal life is to destroy the powers of sin and Satan that rules the world today. That time's coming. Look at verse 2 now, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. Still talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He was crucified at a very young age, 33 and a half years thereabouts as we figure. And we find that he had suffered in the flesh, that his life had been threatened from the time of his birth, and that he was in constant onslaught by the enemy through temptations and trials and, and the anti-God activities that took place from ungodly men in the world today and then as well and so when we so he no longer should live in the flesh of his time in the flesh to the lust of men his time had come in other words to lay down his life to pay the price with his life that you and i might live forever with him in the righteousness and the purity of almighty god what a wonderful thing he had suffered to the point that there was no need further and the timing of God had come for him to pay the ultimate price for you and for me and all those before us that believed upon him and all those that will come after us that will believe upon him. And uh, the price is paid, the power is set, the victory is ours and we can walk into it by accepting the fact that Jesus Christ really was the only begotten Son of God and the sacrificial Lamb to redeem us from our sin and set us free from the terrible bondage that it brings upon all human beings. Now, verse 3, For the time past of our life that may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. Now here the subject changes as Peter begins to remind us Jesus died for us paid the price for us, now he's getting to the point of, that we're going to have to answer to God for, and that he's giving some very good instruction and guidance for all who will believe upon our blessed Lord and Redeemer. He says, in the time past of our life, it was sufficient for us. We just automatically uh, had the attitudes and the weaknesses and the lust of sin and the carnality of the flesh that is so betraying in its desires and uh, makes us believe that there are good things that we need to have and all the time there are things that if we take part of they will destroy us and rob us of the eternal life that Jesus bought and paid for in our behalf. Peter is saying yes we all lived in sin every one of us. 
Now, Pastor, I have been a good person. I have not lied or cheated or stolen. I have not killed anybody. I have not cheated anybody. I have done my best to be helpful to my fellow man. And uh, I'm a good person. And I, I just don't know where you're coming from here. Well, I'm coming from the fact that whether you realize it or not, the spirit that is within you before that new birth experience that we talked about last week uh, comes, uh, uh, that you were a very carnal person bound in a spirit that is filled with the end result of death and damnation, judgment, and outcast from the righteousness and the presence of God for eternity to come unless you accept the price Jesus paid in your behalf and mine that we might live a life that is glorifying the Heavenly Father and our Lord and Redeemer by the quality of life we present in spite of what we used to be before we became converted and born again into the kingdom of God. It says we were serving the law of the Gentiles, the army of the Gentiles, if you please. And the Gentiles here means all those who were heathenistic, all those who were anti-God, all of those who were uh, filled with all kinds of lies and false doctrines and, and uh, lusted after all kinds of things that were wrong and ungodly and impure. And so when we look at the last part of this, it says, when we walked in lasciviousness, what does that mean? That word means simply, we walked in filthy, dirty, impure lust of the carnal flesh. We were filled with the excess of wine. Nothing wrong with having a drink. Oh, pastor, pastor, I'm telling you what the Bible said. Now listen to me. It's not wrong to have a drink of wine. It's not wrong to take a sip of an alcoholic beverage now and then. Well, you just turned me off. What's wrong about it is that we don't have the self-confidence and strength to know that we should not become drunken or inebriated, is a better word maybe, uh, by drinking too much and rioting and partying and what all goes with it when we begin to lose the ability to uh, discipline our thinking and our actions because of the effects the alcohol in uh, abundance within us uh, is not good and it leads us astray. It's a tool of the enemy when it's misused. Today we hear a lot about, oh, I love to party, I love to party. Just enjoy partying. But the truth of the matter is, flesh was the same then as it is now. It's the same now as it was then. And if we let the flesh rule us, we're going to find ourselves in trouble because we'll let the flesh have its way instead of the spirit that has been new and changed and born again within us give us the strength and the wisdom and the knowledge and the ability to say no to sin. I'm not going to yield to that. I'm going to instead keep myself pure and live according to the righteousness of the Word of God and the righteousness of Jesus Christ that He displayed as He walked among the heathen powers of this world and gave His life that you and I might have life and be set free from the bondage of the law of sin and death. Pastor, we hear that every time you give a study. Well, that's what it's all about. Keeping us from straying into the path of the enemy and being destroyed by the deceptions and the lies and the lusts of the flesh that rule anybody that is still in their carnal flesh and not able to discipline themselves in putting a stop to the lust of the flesh and living by the standards of the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when we are converted and changed inside in our spirit, that's being born again. 
and we are born again into the kingdom of God. And we have the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ within our spirit, but we have to determine whether we're going to let that spirit rule us or whether we're going to let the ways of the old carnal nature that we were born with rule us. See, we've been told by a lot of doctrines, a lot of teachings down through the years, well, you can't do this and you can't do that and you can't do something else. And that's all true in many situations. But the matter of the fact is, it's not what we have done or have not done that has put us in the bondage of the law of sin and death. It is the fact that we were born with a dormant spirit spirit within us that had no contact and no ability to fellowship and to uh, have freedom from the bondage of the law of sin that comes through the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus as he paid for us a great price on the cross of Calvary, rose again, praise the Lord, and because he rose again, we will too. It says when we walked in those things of the past, the lust, the excess of wine, revelings, and, uh, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. Remember how Israel was constantly being brought back into compliance under the law that God gave unto them to live by. But then it wouldn't be very long till they again were serving idol gods, worshiping the heathen gods of the ungodly, unwholesome enemies of God and of the Lord Jesus. And as a result of that, uh, we were uh, right along with them. But when we set free from that by the new birth experience, then we can do as Jesus did, and we can say no to sin. I'm not going to participate there. I'm not going to take that text and and uh, and ruin it. I'm going to pass the test. I'm going to come into compliance with the Word of God, and I'm going to live in the righteousness through the strength of God's Word and the Holy Spirit and uh, the covering and the beautiful righteousness that Jesus extended unto us in the new birth experience wherein we can honestly say, yes, as a Christian, a child of God, I am born again into the kingdom of Almighty God for the ages to come. Verse 4, wherein they, th talking about the enemy now, those that walk in the revelings and the lust of the flesh and all of the things we've been talking about, wherein they think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. Well, how many of us have faced the fact that everything was going pretty smooth and we had a circle of friends around us. Uh, some was very, very close and some others were sort of a little more distant. But uh, uh, we didn't have a constant battering of uh, accusations and false uh, uh, charges and all of the tests and trials that we seem to face after we were born again. Why? Because now our spirit is in conflict with the spirit of the world. And the spirit of the world knows that they don't have the communication with us they used to have. They don't have the acceptance of us that they used to have. And they can't understand why we are so different. And it's a big problem for them. And uh, they look at us and say, well, you used to be part of our group. We used to be able to go do these things and that thing and that and something else. We used to be able to have fellowship anywhere and any time. We just had a, a, a close relationship. And now you're a total stranger, they say. Well, it's not that we are going to turn aside and, and hate them and have no use for them. The fact is that the spirit within us will not allow us to live in the bondage of the law of sin and death any longer. Because God has sent us through, through the shedding of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might be redeemed and brought back into the kingdom of God as His people and given the challenge and the charge to keep the word and as 
we live the word, we cannot live the way of the world, we cannot serve idol gods, we have to turn away from destruction and the carnality and sin, corruption of this world. And so, yes, we're still here. Yes, we still have the same body, but the spirit within us has changed because we have been born again into the kingdom of God. And they say, what happened? Well, I, have I done something to offend you, you might say? Well, no, but things are just different. You're not the same. Well, of course we're not the same because the spirit within us that was dead and mortified, as it were, uh, under the old nature of the law of sin and death, that power has been broken and that spirit has been renewed and replaced, uh, recreated, if you please, uh, uh, that uh, we might have the power and the strength to put the old carnal flesh uh, in submission and to live righteously before the heathen world and as an example to them, give them a message of hope and promise that they too can be set free from the bondage that they're going through. Now they look upon us and they think, well, what did I do to offend you? Nothing. Well, why don't you want to fellowship with me anymore? It's not that. What is it? Well, I've had a new insight into my responsibility before God. I recognize that Jesus Christ died for me and shed his blood on the cross of Calvary, that God raised him from the dead, and he paid that price carrying the sins that I've committed and the sins of the world that has been committed against him into submission uh, for all of those who will believe upon him as Lord, Redeemer, Savior, and we give God all praise and glory for that. But you see, the unbeliever who is still bound in the bondage of the law of sin and death cannot see that. They cannot understand that until they see the fruit of what has happened in you and me as we have come to that place of surrendering our will and saying, Lord, your will be done. Cleanse me and set me free from the bondage of the law of sin and death. And oh, listen, they look at us and they rail and, and sometimes we get angry at them. And we say, well, I haven't done anything to hurt you. I, I still uh, care about you and I still have some kind of appreciation for you. It's not a, a thing that I am going to personally come against you, but it is a situation where I have been changed, you have not been changed, and because of the change in me, I have to live and choose to live, would be a better word, for uh, the things of God and the purity of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Redeemer. And so there's a barrier between us now that one cannot understand the other unless they have come to that point of submission unto the call of the Lord Jesus Christ to minister a new birth unto them. Now verse 5, Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? What's being said here? You need to understand that I'm different in my spirit and I have a different lifestyle because I have to give an account now for my life and for how I conduct myself throughout my span here on this earth. And I want you to know that I don't want to fail my Lord and I am free from the law of sin and death and I want to stay there. And I have nothing against you except compassion and love and understanding. And I'd love to share what I know and have experienced in the Lord Jesus Christ with you if you'd be open to receive it. Well, verse 6. For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. 
Now, there's a lot of interpretations for that particular verse. And I'm going to tell you what I am convinced it means and what it means to me. I believe that it's talking about those who walked trying to serve the Lord in the Old Testament, had an honesty of heart to do the right thing, but were unable to do it because they were caught in the bondage of the law of sin and death. They couldn't help themselves. We couldn't either until the Lord intervened and uh, changed us on the inside. Years ago when I was first preaching and teaching, I didn't see things nearly as clearly as I do today. And there were times that I might have preached a different thought on this scripture. But today I want to tell you what I believe it really means. And you can let it go or you can receive it in good faith. It's up to you. But I believe that it says the gospel was preached to those who desired to walk righteously before God in the Old Testament era. We know that Abraham knew what was going on. We know that the prophets of the Old Testament knew what was going on. We know that the kings that led Israel and fought the battles for Israel in the Old Testament days, they knew what was going on. We know that David was aware that Jesus was going to die for him and he was going to be delivered from the bondage of the law of sin and death if he had his faith and belief in the Lord. And there were a lot of Old Testament people who believed very soundly and uh, tenaciously in the Lord Jesus Christ. They were looking forward to the Messiah from the time they were youngsters and were taught by their fathers uh, the promises of God that were given unto the peoples of the Old Testament era. And so I think that Jesus now goes into the area of the dead, spiritually. Says, okay, here I am. I have fulfilled the covenant that God made with you people. I have paid the price for you on the cross of Calvary. I have acknowledged to you that you have been faithful to serve me to the best of your ability, that your heart longed for the day of my coming. And so here I am. And they were made aware that the old failures of the past were under the blood too, just as the failures of you and I today are under the blood and cleansed because Jesus Christ paid the ultimate price to set us free and to give us liberty spiritually here on this earth and in fulfillment and in fulfillment of body, mind, soul, and spirit in the days of eternity. Praise His wonderful name. Verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Now Peter is saying, we don't know when the Lord's coming back. But we do know that the Lord made a change in things. We do know that He's at the right hand of the Father. We do know that He sent the Holy Spirit to be with us here on this earth, available to us as we have need. For those of you who never lived to see that, I want you to see it now. It's done. As He said on the cross of Calvary, it is finished. Praise His name. Hallelujah. The end of all things is at hand. Now you say, well, Pastor, uh, Peter sure didn't know much. He's telling us that the days of the Lord were going to uh, be fulfilled uh, in His return very quickly. Well, he may have believed that. And probably he did. But... You and I, and I've talked about this many times, you and I have our days numbered 
as we walk the face of this earth. And they tick off a day at a time. One, two, three, ten, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, sixty, seventy, and, and the end comes. The end comes for some very early. By the grace of God, he's given this old preacher far beyond anything that he promised to the masses who would believe on him. And I thank him for that. And so I feel the call of God still upon my heart to try to make the Word of God simple to understand, easy to receive, and give you a desire to find the peace and the joy and yes, uh, the tests and trials that all of us go through as we live here on this earth still housed in a body of carnality and failure, corruption. But that's going to change, you see, when Jesus returns. I think I talked to you about that last week in the fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians, where the dead in Christ shall ride first, and then we who remain will be caught up to be with him in the air ever to be with the Lord. And we talked about that, okay? Go with me to verse 8. And above all things have fervent charity, that means love, among yourselves. For charity, I love to begin there, charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Well, let me read it again. I want to be sure I got it right. Above all things have fervent charity and love among yourselves. Oh, well I was told we have to love everybody. God loves everybody. Well, that's really not quite the whole story. There is a special love that God gives to those who are born again. And love shall cover a multitude of sins. What does it mean? It means that when we love one another and we all have shortcomings and failures, sometimes we fail God and we don't want to. Sometimes we let the lust of the old carnal flesh overrule the righteousness of God's loving Son that lives within us when we're born again. And we fail God. We fail the Lord. And Love, instead of condemnation for our brother, our sister in the Lord, is what will bring them past that terrible work of destruction that has come upon them in failure to live as they ought to live under Christ. And because we show love to them, not condemnation, not judgment, not rejection, but concern, compassion, interest, and acceptance of the fact that as we love them and be a friend to them, we then have the ability to strengthen them, to encourage them, to reveal unto them that uh, uh, they can handle these things that come against them in certain ways and, and we can become a tutor, an instructor, an example of how to live the overcoming life in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, by the help and the work of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit as well as the righteousness of Jesus' love within ourselves. Verse 9. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. Well, now, I'm just going to be honest with you. I know, and you know, that even though we've been born again in the kingdom of God, and uh, we know that we're supposed to love one another as Jesus loved us, we know that, but we don't always do it. And... We need to understand that when we don't do it, that we are not being helpful and we are not showing hospitality. But now we come to the point where, well, I know so-and-so did this and so-and-so did that. 
Yes, uh, I know they had a terrible moral problem after they were converted, and after they had that problem, they're just not acceptable to anybody in the church. They're not acceptable uh, to the world either, and so uh, they're left all alone. They don't have a friend in the world that they can talk to. Is the way they feel. And in many cases, that's the way it really is because their brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ have, have judged and condemned them for getting that we face the same battles as they do and that we can overcome only as the God of heaven and the Lord Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, gives us the strength and the ability, the wisdom and the knowledge, the direction and understanding to do so by the work of the Holy Spirit. So we're to love them and be hospitable to them without grudging. Well, what does that really mean? Well, you know, there's brother so-and-so. I never did really care for his personality when uh, he was serving the Lord. And now he just proved me right because he walked off into this uh, terrible sin. And he's, uh, he's, not, he's not serving the Lord. He's failed God and he's failed me. And uh, but God says I'm supposed to be hospitable to him. I'm supposed to love him. And so I'm going to do that. And I'm going to love him. And I, I'm going to love him. But oh, I'll do it because I have to. But I'm not going to do it because I want to. Well, then you're not doing it at all. The instruction here is to say, overlook the one that's struggling to keep the faith, and as you keep the faith, you be a strength and a covering and an instructor and an encouragement to him or her and help them through it. Verse 10, As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Now all of us who have been born again have met someone or has found someone in the circle of our kindred spirit people that is not very likable in their personality. That we just don't really blend with them very easily. But we're going to be hospitable to them. We're going to show them love. But we're going to do it because we have to, not because we want to. Peter is saying you've got to do it because you want to. That's being hospitable. That's being there because you feel you care and you love and you have compassion and you want to help and encourage. Then you have done what you've been commanded to do as you minister one to another. So here Peter is instructing now, beginning with uh, uh, verse 9. So as we minister one to another as good stewards of the grace of God. We go to verse 11. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. I want to stop there. A lot of people speak and they say, well, I say speak as the oracles of God. And so here they find this brother, this sister that has transgressed the love and, and the love of the Lord and headed back into the deep paths of sin. And we know we should stop and help them, but we don't like them to begin with. And so we'll do it, but we'll do it because we have to. Now Peter is saying, no, 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 that's not it. Peter is saying, if you're going to speak, you speak as the oracles of God. In other words, you speak as the Lord is speaking, as the Holy Spirit would speak and is speaking, as the Heavenly Father is speaking. Not as you and your carnal flesh, who's fighting the same battle perhaps, and have had the strength to discipline yourselves not to fall into the trap. We need to be very tender toward those who have failed and love them, encourage them, and guide them back into victory. The next part of this verse, if any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth. 
Now, we've all met those Christians who, number one, they are our judges. They look at our life under a microscope. If they see a little speck of trouble, they come to us, and what do they do? Listen, brother, the Word of God says thus, 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 thus. And, uh, and then it says thus, 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 thus. And about after ten scriptures, they say, well, God bless you. I hope that helps you. It may, and it may not. Did you say it in the Spirit of the Lord? Did you say it with the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ? Did you say it because you honestly care for their soul that be preserved in the kingdom of God for the ages to come? Or are you just doing a job? If you're just doing a job, you're not doing it at all. Think about that. Let him minister as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now that was a little short sermon that Peter left for all of us to really think about, absorb, and live by. Go with me now to some further instructions that we find. And he's talking to us now about the warfare that's going to go on against us as we serve the Lord. Oh, I didn't know I was joining another army. I didn't know I was going to be... Well, Peter is saying, I want to set your understanding straight. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Don't wonder about, why is God letting this happen to me? I tr trusted God and I asked God and I, I claimed the victory in God and the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and I know I've been born again, but I'm still having this terrible battle. Now it's worse than it's ever been. Don't think of it as something strange that happened. Don't be shocked, but be on your guard from the moment that you accept Jesus as Lord. You have become the enemy of the ungodly world and the heathen that live therein. Verse 13, But rejoice, inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. We've all said it. We all stand upon it. You can't understand what another is going through until you've walked there yourself. You can't understand the pathway another is in until you've walked in that pathway yourself. And now you've been set free from that pathway by the strength and the victory of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But now, because you have been set free, doesn't mean that you're perfect, and it doesn't mean that those round about you are perfect, and it doesn't mean that you're isolated from tests and trials. Now, here's something that is going to be hard for you to accept. There are many of you who have been taught to, that, uh, well, if you pray to be healed, if you pray for this or that, if you uh, pray for this person's need and, and another person's uh, failures and, and you're constantly in prayer and you pray and you pray believing, that if it doesn't come and doesn't happen just like you prayed or doesn't happen at all seemingly uh, at the moment, you get down and discourage and you say, huh? God don't answer prayer. I prayed this and I prayed that. And most of the time when we pray those things, we're praying selfish, carnal, lustful wishes that satisfy the flesh. And it says, when we're reproached, when we go through the fiery trials and we walk through them with strength and glory and victory, that we should rejoice because now we have enough understanding by experience 
of just a little bit of what Jesus went through when he died for me and died for you. I can understand because I've lived a little tiny bit of it myself. Jesus was unjustly accused. He was unmercifully tested and tried. He was ridiculed and rejected. He was tormented by the demon powers of hell. On and on and on we could go. And beloved, you and I are going to face the same battles, but thank God, not in the dimension that he did. But it's important, beloved, that we're not caught off guard, that we don't act shocked and surprised, but that rather that we are counted worthy to suffer in a small measure with Jesus. Now we understand, Jesus, the tears that were in your eyes as you wept over the children of Israel when they would not serve you. Shortest scripture verse in the Word. Jesus wept. Have we come to the place where when we go through these things and look at others that are not walking in victory and need help, that we, because of what we have gone through and what we're going through, can be faithful to the Lord and weep in behalf of those that are falling short? Care enough about them that we would do anything we could to pull them back into the full fellowship of the Lord Jesus Christ? Can we do that? But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Oh! How are you going to get the speck out of your brother's eye when you've got a two by four on your own? See, we need to have compassion and love, tenderness, not condemnation. I've often marveled and I've preached on this from time to time. I'm going to be blunt. The town whore can come to Christ, be genuinely converted, change her lifestyle or his, and the church will take the man, wonderful, marvelous, praise the Lord, they can hold any position in the church. They're accepted by anybody in the church or most. There will always be those who won't. But basically they're accepted by the church body. And the person that has walked with the Lord, been through some heavy, heavy trials, fiery trials, trials that are beyond their capacity to even understand what is all about and certainly not able to uh, overcome what's come against them. And if they've committed a sin, we'll never let them forget it. No matter whether it was 20 years, 30 years, 40 years ago, it doesn't matter. They failed God and we're never going to forget. Oh, yes, they serve the Lord today, brother. Yes, they're good Christians today. But I remember when. How often do we see and hear and are confronted with those kinds of stories and expressions? Don't let it be guilty in your life. Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Rejoice. The fact you're facing it, the fact that it's come against you, is a sign that you are the enemy of their evil doings. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. The congregations of any church that rests on the Word of God believes the Word of God, preaches and teaches the Word of God, has someone, and sometimes numerous others, 
that are going to be judgmental. They're going to hold a grudge. They're going to be unable or unwilling to show the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, among the final words that the Lord spoke on the cross of Calvary, the multitude, including his disciples, his relatives, were there at the foot of the cross as he hung there and was about ready to give up his last breath. And he looked at them and he said, Father, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't have a clue. They don't understand. And I'm sure that the tears of the Lord Jesus Christ fell to the ground as the flow of blood fell from his body. He cared, he loved, he prayed. And he did not fail. Folks, we need to remember that there's only one thing we need to do in this world when it comes to pleasing. And that is that if we always walk in the obedience and the pleasure of God's will, doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. Let them think, let them do to us what they will. But we will not fail the Lord because we're unprepared to face the fiery trial. Well, I've been told that when you pray, if you don't get the answer right now, that there's something wrong with you, you don't have any faith or, or uh, whatever, uh, you're asking for the wrong thing, and, and uh, you know, lots of excuses, but how am I supposed to do this? Well, you need to remember something. It was by the grace and the love, the tenderness and the mercy and the wonderful compassion of our Lord Jesus Christ that he called upon you to serve him. And when he called upon you, he may have called upon you many times. No, nope. no, not now, Lord. Again, he'd come. No, no, not now. Again, he might come. No, but it was a little more distant this time. And then the next time it was, you hardly heard him. What was happening? You were denying his call, his compassion, his love, the price he paid for you. Finally you say, and probably it's after some kind of a great kind of a disaster, trouble, difficulty, whatever, that is beyond your capacity to handle. And what happens? Yes, Lord, I need your help. And you've come to that place of true repentance. Be thankful that there are brothers and sisters who are praying for you. Think about it. Think about it. Judgment is to come at the house of God. It begins there. And if it first began in us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God. In other words, if we can backslide and fall away from the grace and the gift of God for eternal life, allow our spirit to be contaminated and saturated with the lust of the sin of the world. No longer clean and pure. We need to realize where Jesus was walking when he called us the first time. And now he's calling us again to get back to where we should be. Or maybe he's called us many times and we've drawn farther and farther away instead of coming close and saying, help me, Lord, I'm a sinner. Something to think about, isn't it? Verse 18, And if the righteous scarcely can be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? The last verse in the lesson today. Wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well-doing as unto a faithful Creator. We owe a great debt 
to our Lord, Redeemer, and Savior. Sometimes we suffer as a testimony to others, and God gives us the strength to handle it. He does tell us He won't allow something to come upon us that we cannot bear, cannot handle. And so with that commitment and that covenant promise to God, Lord, help me, purify me, cleanse me, give me a new touch of the mighty glorious victory and power of your righteousness within my spirit today. I pray. to the book of Luke chapter 22 verse 14 and when the hour was come he sat down and the twelve apostles with him and he said unto them with desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer for I say unto you I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God and he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks, break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Let us take of the bread and eat together. Praise His name. Likewise also the cup of after supper saying, This cup is the New Testament to my blood, which is shed for you. As we drink of it, let us remember the price Jesus paid. Let us drink of the cup. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for listening to Christian Living 101. Remember, we are totally dependent upon your prayers and generosity. Log on to ChristianLiving101.org. There are over 300 video Bible studies there, plus many other items of interest with Pastor Applegate. We welcome your prayer requests and your questions. Please contact us at Christian Living 101. That's P.O. Box 72150 in Phoenix, Arizona, 85050. Or email Gene at Gene, with a G-E-N-E, Gene at ChristianLiving101.org.